بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على مبعوث رحمة العالمين سيدنا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا قائد الغر المحجلين وشفيع المذنبين وسيدي والدي آدم الفخر محمد بن عبد الله الهاشمي القرشي وعلى آله وأصحابه ونوالا ثم أما بعد So alhamdulillah I believe this is our fifth session of the sessions entitled Beautiful Islam and many thanks to the Beacon team uh, and uh, CD uh, Ayub for helping to get us started this evening and as we have been discussing over the past what has now been a month or so uh, looking at the divide uh, so-called perceived divide between religiosity and spirituality or between religious practice and between uh, spiritual connection and we had mentioned several times that uh, most people uh, are very interested in spiritual connection most people are interested in feeling uh, something bigger than themselves uh, and, and feeling a sense of purpose and a feeling a sense of uh, connection to something sublime and something um, sacred uh, as it were uh, but the issue then becomes how do we understand that in terms of religious practice and sometimes religiosity, religious practice, or uh, ritual uh, devotions of religion have often been maligned uh, to some extent uh, within our tradition, within Islam, and, and even within other religious traditions. And sometimes I think the cause of that may be the perceived gatekeepers or the, uh, those who uh, decide the criteria for what religious or sound religious practice looks like. And sometimes that um, can be abusive and distressful. Uh, you know, the Quran mentions that uh, those before us, اتخذوا الرهبان والأحبار إلها من دون الله أربابا من دون الله That they took the uh, monks and the, um, and the rabbis as lords other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what was perceived as the, those who would give you access or those who would facilitate your connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, would often also be uh, uh, sometimes the purveyors of abuse. And in this case, the, the greatest abuse is to take them as uh, more sacred than God or to take them as gods besides uh, or with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why you, you find many people today are very much interested, I think, or one of the reasons people are very much interested in spiritual connection uh, and may not have really that big an interest in religious practice, especially organized religious practice. And that often comes in the form of like uh, Jum'ah for Muslims, obviously, and uh, church services for Christians of all denominations and uh, uh, synagogue uh, and uh, holy days and high holy day services for for Jews and so I don't think the problem if we're going to call it that is unique to us uh, but I think we can also find the the root causes uh, somewhat similar as well and if we you know I've made these sessions a little bit of real talk so I'm going to engage in a little bit of real talk uh, if we look at most of the Friday services at least in uh, in the United States that, that I have access to that I have attended, um, they, they are subpar. And uh, part of the reason for this is uh, many reasons, but I think one, one of the, the general reasons is we have a failure to appreciate the moment uh, and a failure to appreciate what are really the needs of, of Muslims today. And it takes... Uh, people who are very well versed in the tradition itself, in, in the disciplines of Islam. And it takes people also who are very aware of where their congregants are at, uh, where the Muslims are at, where their people are at. Uh, so instead of talking at people, right, we have kind of like the standard sermon and this is the things I have to say, uh, we talk to people. right, And we're not just talking to you know, and specifically we're talking to their hearts. We're trying to get something across to them that, inshallah, when they leave the masjid, they come away with something. And not just fulfilling a mere obligation or routine. 
uh, and so forth. So I think, you know, uh, one of the things um, that is, is going to be very important and critical and essential in having some sort of revival or revivification of our practice of Islam and then its connection to spirituality is the Friday Juma, is the Friday service itself has to be reimagined um, in, in a sense, not reformed, not kind of change the fiqh rules, but reimagined in, in the ways that, that, that we're actually doing it. Um, and that's something that's not an individual effort or even one single mosque, but that, that, that's a concerted community effort, uh, ummah-wide effort, I would say. So anyway, we're not really here to kind of uh, look at all those particular different issues, but we, we, we're trying our best to make it something that's relevant and something that is going to address the needs of the community. So when we're talking about beautiful Islam, um, and we said that our frame of reference here are some of the works, uh, particularly the work of Ibn Atta'illah al Sakandri Al-Hikam. Uh, and one of the reasons that this particular work is uh, resonates so much is that the meanings in it are timeless, and they are um, uh, based upon uh, not just you know one one person, one man's uh, creative sayings. You know, he got creative and, and he came up with these things and he sat there and thought about it. What would be the best way to phrase this? No, it's actually, there's a whole community be behind a man like Ibn Atta al-Sakandari, right? Which are his teachers and which first and foremost is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And his own personal connection, his own spiritual connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what we're seeing in things like the hikam is the end result of what a spiritual connection looks like. And, and, you know, and you can call what he comes up with, and not what he comes up with, but what he's inspired to write, uh, these waridat or ilhamat, right? Waridat means things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in his heart, you know, that's how we see it, or ilhamat, things that Allah inspired him to, that is not, um, you know, that doesn't come out of a vacuum, that's, that's years of work, right? That's years of spiritual work, that's years of sitting with teachers, that's years of self-purification, and working on one's shortcomings and one's failings and um, uh, tolerating uh, uh, hurt from people and, and, and tolerating people's idiosyncrasies and, uh, and people's inconsistencies and so forth and, um, and, and, and kind of, you know, imbibing really the, the, the Muhammadan discipline, right? The discipline of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in, in dhikr and qiyam al-layl and uh, observing all of the uh, uh, observant aspects of Islam, right? The ritual aspects, and and obviously, as we said, uh, you know, the, the the high virtues and the great virtues of the Deen of, of patience and forbearance and gratitude and um, good character, tolerance of others, temperance, wisdom, and then also removing vice, right? And struggling with that, and that comes um, from uh, yeah, any kind of a pedagogical. Uh, uh, review it comes first it's primary right because you have to remove vice and then virtue can be allowed to enter um, and you can't really be uh, virtuous and, and vice driven at the same time because they're they're opposites right they, they can't coexist it's like oil and water uh, and so the removal of vice and what they refer to as a and then the embodiment of virtue that they uh, refer to as tahliya right sweetening the the soul uh, as it were and then comes the tajliya, right? Tajliya means then the connection, right? The spiritual connection is what you can call the tajliya. Tajliya means uh, يعني, You see the things as they are, as they are manifesting and as they are uh, manifestations of the beautiful names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's, you know, that is the connection. It's not some sort of false, um, you know, uh, uh, practitioner, guru-based uh, aggrandizement of the self and then, you know, disguising that and it's masquerading as some sort of opening or nirvana or uh, some sort of spiritual enlightenment when it's really just a celebration of the self. No enlightenment is not is going to come out except if it's the um, the replacement of, of celebration of the self with the celebration of God. Uh, you can't be celebrating yourself and at the same time Celebrating Allah and having that opening to to seeing a reality as it is So we had mentioned last session or last week About rectification of acts rectification of deeds and we mentioned some of the uh, 
the hikam uh, that uh, Ibn Atta al-Sakandari mentions in this regard. You know, he says, deeds are mere forms and their spirits are the presence of the secret of sincerity within them. Right? So what gives life to the deed or to the spirit, the, the, the religious observance is what's behind it. So their forms, right? the, the prayer and the standing, it's not just exercise or calisthenics or some enlightened form of tai chi or, or, or yoga. No, but the movements themselves are significant and the movements themselves um, uh, can lead to uh, spiritual connection and can lead to what they call telween and temkin. Right, the, the, the coloring of the soul, right, or the flowering of the soul, let's call it, and then it temkin, right, a thubut with tethbit, you know, to be well grounded uh, in, in that uh, uh, recognition of the divine presence in all things. So, uh, the rectification of then of our deeds be, begin is really a, a, a matter of a work of the heart, right, of, of rectif rectification of the soul. But we work on the outward aspect uh, initially. In order then, so then we could look towards something of a higher plane, like the rectification of our fikr, the rectification of our thoughts, and of our states, and uh, of our uh, ability to deal with circumstances and what we consider to be adverse events, uh, and our reaction to them. Uh, and, and, and these things you, you can actually advance in and you could develop and, and, and you could become a much better for, person for it um, rather than just reacting emotively and reacting uh, in, in the time based upon a, a kind of a lower nafsani um, place of, uh, of, uh, of the soul versus something that's on a, on a much higher place that never really leaves or never loses sight of Allah being and Qadir and uh, Alim and, and aware and knowledgeable of all the things that are happening and he's the one who's, who's making them happen and he is the one who is يُجَدِّدِ الْخَلْقِ you know, he is the one who is renewing creation in every infinitesimal moment these are the haqqaiq, right? that's the reality and uh, we can acknowledge that intellectually but at a higher level we can also uh, witness that spiritually right? and, and that, that becomes one of the thamarat that becomes one of the fruits of putting in this work Right, and that we can wait a minute. I, I'm seeing reality differently now. Right, I'm not so swayed by um, the the mirage. Right, but I actually can see what's behind the edifice and ma'ani wa al mabani. Right, the meanings behind the facades. So um, this uh, session, I want to talk about something related that may come logically, perhaps in the same uh, in that order, or maybe not. But the idea of how do we engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And specifically, how do we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we speak to Him? How do we ask for things? How do we remember Him? Uh, those specific things. And you know, one of my teachers once said that, um, he said, Allah fan, that uh, speaking to Allah is an art form. Right? There has to be, if you do it with understanding, and you do it with what's really intended in the way that we engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it becomes a totally different thing than just kind of routine. Uh, every, every utterance, every word, every letter from every word has a significance. Uh, especially if they're the words of Allah, and then you're reciting them back to Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ said that with every letter of, of the Qur'an, there's a significance and a reward. And he didn't, he didn't say, Alif, Lam, Mim, Harf. He said, Alif, Un, Harf, Wa, Lam, Un, Harf, Wa, Mim, Un, Harf. So even those three letters that begin some of the surahs, like Surah Al-Baqarah uh, and Surah Al-Quman, Alif, Lam, Mim. He said, Alif is, uh, is a harf and is a letter, and Lam is a letter, and Mim is a letter, not the three by themselves. So each one of them is significant in of itself. Uh, and if that's true for those letters that carry a meaning that may be secret, uh, and not known or not easily discerned by most people, but they have a meaning nonetheless that Allah intended in them. Then what about the whole rest of the uh, of the Quran, al ayat al muhkamat and al ayat al mutashabihat? Right, al ayat al muhkamat, the commanding verses that are clear and that are there to guide us, and then the ayat al mutashabihat, la yarifuhunna kathirun min al-nas. Not a lot of people know the meaning of them, but they carry a meaning, um, and perhaps one could infer that 
for those that it does carry a meaning or that it can convey a particular meaning, it requires a higher level of engagement, right? Uh, and not just on an intellectual level and deciphering the Arabic uh, uh, and, and, you know, using what's at your disposal of knowledge of, of Arabic rhetoric and, and, and composition, but also a higher spiritual understanding, right? Uh, that's, that goes beyond that. And this is what people like Imam al-Ghazali, Imam al Arabi, they talked about, that the Qur'an is a bahar, Right? It's an ocean, it's a vast ocean, it's an immense ocean, and uh, you, you're just looking at the tish, you're just looking at the outer shell when you're looking at what we call tafsir today. All of the tafsir that have been written that are explaining the meanings of the Qur'an, the vast majority of them, from at tabari and Ibn Kathir and uh, uh, Safwat al-Tafsir for the great alim who just passed away recently, uh, Sheikh Ali Sabuni, uh, rahimahullah, you know, they're, they're giving you, they're conveying you the, the, the main meanings. But to dig deeper, right, requires an, a level of engagement with Qur'an, a level of engagement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that goes beyond the cursory, that goes beyond just, as Ghazali mentioned in, uh, in Jawahir al-Qur'an, just the basic uh, uh, exterior meanings or inward meanings that will only come to those who are able to approach the Qur'an with safa. Right, with purity and purity of intention. Right, no one shall penetrate it, no one shall actually touch it. Right, the ones who, who are uh, free and are pure from doubts and pure from uh, illusion and, and pure from all those things that would cloud one's basira or, or spiritual eye to actually uh, understand those meanings. So, um, if we talk about, well, how do we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what's the purpose of it? So the general word, when we engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is this word called dhikr, right? Dhal kafra. Alladheena yathkuru Allah kathiran wa qiyaman wa qurudu ala jurubihim wa dhakiru Allah kathiran wa dhakirat. It's mentioned many times in the Qur'an. فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ يَذْكُرْكُمْ وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ You know, remember Allah, He remembers you. So this remembrance, uh, al-dhikr, uh, and other verses, هَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ right? مِنْ مُدَّكِرْ it means. Uh, is there anyone who remembers? So, al-ma'ani tufam bil abdad Words can be understood by their opposites. Meanings can be understood by their opposites. So what's the opposite of, of remembrance? Will it be something like forgetfulness? And some of the uh, scholars of Arabic said the insan, insan, which is what we are, al insani, uh, it can be possibly derived from the word nasiya, to forget. So insan, one of the meanings of being an insan, is in nisyan, is that we're forgetful, um, and we're forgetful of, obviously, the conventional forgetfulness. I forgot where I put my car keys. That type of forgetfulness, but more importantly, the forgetfulness of what are we doing here, and what's our purpose, and, um, uh, you know, am I acting towards uh, fulfilling that, that, that purpose that Allah SWT has put us here for, that type of nisyan. Uh, and some have said also the word insan comes from the word al-uns, right, which is just taqlib, ayn uh, al-kalima wa al kalima as they say, so it's switching the last two letters. So nasiya wa anisa, so nisyan means to forget, uh, anisa ya nasu, uh, unsan means to find intimacy. So both of those meanings actually relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So you find uns, or uns billah, or uns bihadratil rabb, right? Uns uh, or intimacy in the presence of God. Or you could be the opposite. You could be nasi. You can have nisyan. You could forget that that's there to begin with. And then you become busy with your, your, your nafs. Right, your your insaniya, as it were, or, or the the basic part of who you are, and not the 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 more meaningful and more significant part of who you are. So then, the dhikr, the main purpose of it, is to um, uh, to root out or to counter an nisyan, one ghafla, they say. So ghafla uh, is a type of nisyan, but it is. Uh, the type where you're not even aware that you're in a state of nisyan, that you're in a state of forgetfulness. So, uh, insan al-ghafil or al-mutaghafil, 
doesn't even know that they're missing out on something. I'm a nasi, as soon as you remind them, like, oh yeah, that's right, that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, but al uh, la, uh, it's kind of a deeper type of, uh, of forgetfulness. So the dhikr is supposed to uh, counter this. Um, uh, and, you know, I would think the way we look at it, that our default state is not ghafla, it's dhikr, right? Um, if we are um, left to our fitrah, if we are left to our primordial state, then we are people who, who have dhikr, who remember, and who remember the most important moment of our ancient life. Right when the souls were created and we were there too, and then we all worship, we all bore witness before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala when He asked us, "Alas tubarabikum qalu bala shahidna," and we said, "Bala, of course you are our Lord." We bear witness to that, uh, shahidna. And so, in a, uh, this mushahada, uh, this shuhud is not just intellectually okay, makes sense, bear witness. No, it means I witness it, right? Body, soul, spirit, everything sees that, it bears witness to it. And so some of them have said that dhikr is just actually really taking us back to that point, uh, to the remembrance of that moment. And then if we remember that moment, at least even on a, I'm not going to say a subconscious level, but on a level of the, of the ruh, of the spirit, or of the sir, or the innermost part of the, the spirit, um, then we reconnect. And then we are the soulful and spiritual beings that we're supposed to be. Uh, and not just these corporal entities that, yes, have uh, flesh and blood and circulatory systems and respiratory systems and so forth, all those things that maintain our life or how we understand to maintain the physical life, but um, the, uh, the spiritual life, which has a direct connection to the, the next life, the akhirah, also needs to be uh, maintained and it needs to be taken care of and it needs to be paid attention to. And so dhikr then is that. Uh, and there are many hadith that talk about dhikr, how about the angels looking for halaq al-dhikr, they look for the circles of dhikr, and, and here in this sense it means, many of them said, circles of knowledge. So even uh, learning something uh, beneficial is a type of dhikr, it's a type of remembrance, because we as, as the sons and daughters of Adam, that's what we're here for, and that's what makes us unique from all creatures, that we can learn and we can know, um, and we can observe and witness reality. Um, uh, on its highest level. So that's something that's quite important in terms of who we are as human beings. So, um, what then about dhikr? How do we go about doing it? What should we be thinking? And, and so forth. And how does that relate to uh, what we know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How does that tie in, as we said earlier, to reality, what we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So, much has been written about dhikr, and we're going to go over some of the hikam uh, that Ibn Atta wrote about it. Uh, but basically, you can think of dhikr, remembering God, as kind of three main ways to do it. Three main um, branches, if you will, three main categories. So, there is... Um, praise, so we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a way of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not a coincidence. That's how we start when we read Surah Al-Fatiha. After the Basmalah, we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Right? That's praise. And we, uh, as Muslims, have been kind of, it's been ingrained in us and, 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 and conditioned us that we should get used to saying that a lot. Because uh, praising Allah is not just an acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's an acknowledgement of Everything you have is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say Alhamdulillah, which literally can be translated as the praise, it means you know you find it most times translated as all praise. Because they say al alif wa lam hina al-istighraq al-jins, which means it covers all categories of praise. So any type of praise is uh, that you can think of is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost. Uh, and you know, we can praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'am. We can praise Him for all of the bounties and gifts and favors He's bestowed upon us, and that's one way to praise Him. Or we can praise Him because He is worthy of praise, right? And that's actually looking more towards the attributes and names of God, and that's how that relates to that. And that was the way that uh, the Sahaba and the awliya and our Prophet 
praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La nuhsi thana'an alayk inta kama athnayta ala nafsik. And even the recognition that you can't properly praise Allah. Right, so, you know, in, in human interactions, we think, okay, they gave me a gift, I said thank you, I give them a gift similar, now we're even. But there's no such transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will never be even. There, there, there's nothing you can do that is going to fulfill the, uh, or, or equal or equate to what he's given you. And so the greatest form of praising him then, which was the praise of our Prophet Sallallahu is acknowledging that you can't properly praise him. And that's really a very important meaning, right? If, if our way with God, our engagement with him is thinking we're paying him back for something, or even worse, that we are soliciting something from him by doing these things he required of us and then we're getting something in return, that's very transactional. Um, and our relationship with Allah is not about a transaction, it's about devotion. It's about dedication, it's about commitment, it's about sacrifice, it's about recognition that everything you are and that you have and everything that you ever will be is only by, Allah, by Allah's pleasure and only by Allah's will and only by Allah's uh, 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 love of you. Because he could have chosen someone else to give all those things to, but he chose us. And uh, so the tariqat al-mahabba, the way of love, the way of mahabba then is to, you know, never really have a moment that goes by where you're not cognizant or acknowledging of all of the things that you have and that they are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So praise. And then another aspect, important aspect of our engagement with Allah is supplication, a dua And this is probably the one people are most familiar with. I shouldn't say most familiar, but um, the one that they probably uh, think about the most or go to the most or, or, or see it as uh, the one that they are in the greatest need of, the dua. Right, we have to ask Allah for things because, you know, things are not going to go right for us unless we ask Allah to do it for us, and and it would not go any other way except by asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And this is not untrue, that sentiment, but it's not the whole truth. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Adua mukhul ibadah, adua u mukhul ibadah." Right, the dua is the marrow or the the core of ibadah, and here ibadah can mean ubudiya, right, of servitude and of service to Allah. But sometimes people get the impression that when I'm asking Allah, I'm actually trying, I'm asking Him to serve me in some way. Right? There's something that I want, there's something that I need, and I'm asking Him to give it to me. And, um, and it's a recognition that no one else can give it to you, which is absolutely true, no one else can give it to you. But is that the best way to, to engage with your Creator? Again, it becomes a little bit transactional. You know, I'm asking for something because I need it and only He can give it to me. Um, but supplication is so much more than that. The dua is so much more than that. And we'll see in some of the hikam that we're going to go over, kind of the nuance in, in understanding the, the power of the dua um, and so forth. And we have a fixation with the dua al-mustajab, right? The, the answer dua. And this dua al-mustajab, sometimes we narrowly define it. Like Allah Sallallahu gives me exactly what I'm asking for in the time that I'm asking for it, then my dua was unanswered or hashahu unheard. Sometimes I've heard people say that. How come Allah doesn't hear my dua? Which is, if you followed with us from the beginning in the aqidah, that's impossible. That Allah doesn't hear your dua. Because huwa sami'u wal basir. يَسْمَعْ كُلَّ الْمَسْمُوعَاتِ He is uh, a samia, he hears everything. So even the things that are not even said, he hears them. He hears the, the, uh, the khawatir of your heart, right? He hears the thoughts in your heart that you never even said to anybody. So that can't be true. So if we're, if we're firm and we're, and we're clear on, you know, the, 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 the aqidah aspect of that, then there's no way that Allah SWT can't hear what we're asking for. So then we have to think about it further. Is Allah truly not answering my dua? Or is there something more going on here? It's not a question of Allah not hearing me. He certainly hears me. And if He doesn't give it to me in the way that I want exactly, and Allah SWT is also Alim and Hakim, right? He, is most, he has complete perfect knowledge, complete perfect wisdom, then 
I should also know, if I know Allah, then I know that maybe the thing I'm asking for in the time that I want it, it's not the best thing for me. And maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since it was an act of love to bring me here to begin with and to put me on this planet, then perhaps it's also an act of love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in as much as we understand how love emanates from God, that He is not giving me the thing that I want in the time that I want exactly as I want. And He may be reserving it from another time, or maybe delaying it. Or maybe He's going to give me something much better. Uh, and then one may ask, well then, if that's true, then why make the out to begin with? If Allah knows everything and everything's settled and, and that sort of thing, and then that takes us back to, well, what's the relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? He is the one that is worshipped. He is the one who is sovereign over all things. And you are the one who is in, in, in servitude to, towards Allah. And that relationship has to be predicated on a recognition of He is the one not in need of anything and you are in complete need of everything. So if you are in complete need of everything, why would you not ask for it? So it's an, it's an act of worship to ask. Right? And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more. And then the third um, uh, uh, way of engaging or speaking to Allah that I think not a lot of people may have heard of or are cognizant of is what some have called ar riaya And I translate this as keeping, you know, in the sense when you say, uh, you know, may Allah bless you and keep you. What does it mean for Allah to keep you? Yani, yubqiqa, right, keeps you, yani, you're still around, but also to take care of you, riaya. And this is like al khitabat So we're not really asking Allah for something, but we are speaking to Allah, or we're, we're, we're pleading with Him, or we are um, having a munajah, we're having a conversation with Him. So some of the prophets, for example, um, what did Ayyub say, alayhi salam, when he found this uh, sickness that he was in? إِنِّي مَسَّنِي الدُّرْوَ أَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ that's not really sigha dua. That's not in the form of an asking something. It's a statement. Inni masani dur. I have been touched by harm. Wa anta arham rahimin And you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. Right? It's like, yani irani rab. Yani there's riaya. There's a, a recognition. Only Allah subhanahu wa taala is the one who can take care of you and keep you and and so forth. What did Yunus ibn Matta, the moon, in the belly of the whale, say? La ilaha illa an subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimin. It's not a dua. Yani in the form of dua. La ilaha illa ant. There's no God except you. Subhanak. Glory to you. Inni kuntu min al-zalimin. I am from the zalimin. I am from those who have wronged. Again, it's a statement. What did Musa alayhi salam say when he uh, 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 helped the, the two daughters of uh, Shu'ib of, uh, of Madian? And uh, you know, went to the well and got the, the water for them, and then he sat under a tree. What did he say? Uh, for that which you can send down upon me, I am in complete need. What did the Prophet ﷺ say after Ta'if in the Bustan of Addas? If you are not angry with me, none of this matters. The important thing is رضاك يا رب. That's why some of them say, they would say, أنت مطلوبي ورضاك مقصودي. أنت مطلوبي ورضاك مقصودي. You are the one that I seek, and your pleasure is what I, is my purpose. And some of them would say, Allahu ma'i, Allahu nadirun ilay. You know, Allah is with me, Allah is seeing me. Right, so they, there's a statement of the ma'iya and the statement of muraqaba. Wallahu nadirun ilay, and Allah sees me. Um, and you know, this is what uh, kind of looking at the ever presence of Allah, not as something that is uh, like a, a proverbial spiritual hammer to knock you over the head and scare you, and to, you know, because you could interpret the verses that way. Wallahu ma'akum aina ma kuntum. Wait, Allahu ma'akum aina ma kuntum. Allah is with me wherever I am. Like, I can't hide all, all the bad things that I do then yeah, certainly I'm going to be damned then because I can't hide anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or you can look at it, Wallahu ma'akum aina ma kuntum. Yani Allah is with us everywhere we are. How beautiful is that? How blessed is that? We're never alone. 
And the Prophet ﷺ reminded Abu Bakr as-Siddiq in the cave, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. So obviously the, this ma'iyya he was talking about there is the opposite of al-huzn. Because he told uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, لا تحزن. So he's not telling him, إن الله معنا. Uh-oh, be careful, watch your deeds because Allah is watching us. Well, who's Abu Bakr? <laughs> he is the best Muslim to ever lived uh, during that generation, obviously after the Prophet ﷺ. But he's saying, لا تحزن. Don't worry, don't grieve. Everything we find, in الله معنا. إن الله معنا. Allah is with us. So this, this type of khitab, uh, it's very beautiful and it's something that was done by the prophets and then many of the scholars and the awliya and, the, uh, and, and, and those who you know, were blessed enough to, to be given these deep, penetrative, profound meanings and understandings. Uh, it's something that just comes out. Right? And I've been with people who, you, they, that's how they talk all the time. That's just like, like who you're talking to, but they're talking to Allah. Yeah, the, there's this khitab, there's this, uh, you know, and some of them, it's not even words that come out. Um, you know, one of the awliya, he said, uh, for 30 years people thought I was talking to them, but I was actually talking to Allah. My, my khitab, my, my relationship is with Allah. They're there, but I see them as just uh, intermediaries and tools of Allah. I'm not, I'm not really, you know, my main relationship is with, uh, with uh, the provider and the sustainer and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, we want to have this ever-present khitab, address, engagement with Allah. And it need not be always be with the tongue. At a higher level, it's with your heart. Right? And, and, and you don't have to, you know, be someone who who's looks like he's speaking to himself and look weird. I'm not saying that, but someone who, whose heart is constantly engaged. But the, the first step is remembrance with, uh, with the tongue, right? And then this dhikr of the tongue then will lead to that shuhudi engagement, right? So a witnessing of God and everything uh, of the heart. Um, and some say that uh, dhikr and shuhud are kind of on the opposite sides of each other. Why? Because dhikr means dhakir. Remembrance means there's a rememberer. So there's the I, there's the you in that, saying, oh, I'm remembering, I'm making dhikr. But shuhud is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the covering, or let's call it the, 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 the encompassing of the divine attributes over the human attributes. So the shahid and mashhud become one, right? So the one who is doing the witnessing, known as being witnessed, in, for, in, in essence, are one. Because you're, you're, you're not aware of, oh, I'm making the, the ana, the I part goes away. So then it, then it becomes shuhud. And it's not really dhikr anymore. I mean, technically it is, but on a higher plane from a, from a shuhudi understanding, from a witnessing understanding, it just becomes all witnessing or shuhud. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the goal of dhikr, to, to get to that point, so that you have qalb dhikr. You know, and when the Prophet said him, he gave the wasiyah, uh, 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 you know, may your tongue ever be uh, wet with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know. And, and some of the hadith mentioned, you know, be a dhakir and, and remember Allah until they say that, uh, uh, you know, they think you're crazy. And in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that's included in the uh, Manazil al-Sa'irin, the other class that we teach, sabaq uh, al-mufarridun, you know, the mufarridun, the ones who do tafrid, the one who like single Allah out for everything, who, who are they? Man hum ya Rasulullah, alladheena yastahtiruna bi dhikrillah. Right, the ones who are so uh, consumed by the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and dhikr is one of those things you can't do too much of it. You know, no one can, no one ever said to anybody, "Akhi, you're doing too much dhikr." <laughs> it doesn't happen, right? Allah dhikran kathira, right? Allah dhikran kathira. Remember much, so you could be doing whatever you're doing in your daily routine or your daily day, but you could still be. Qalb uh, hai Your heart could be alive with the remembrance of uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So let's look at some of the uh, hikam that uh, Ibn Athat mentioned. He has one particular in dhikr. Let me start with that one, where he says, "Do not abandon remembrance dhikr." For your lack of presence with Allah in it. For your remissness of the remembrance of Allah is worse than your remissness 
in the remembrance of Allah. Perhaps He will raise you from a state of remembrance accompanied by remissness to a state of remembrance accompanied by awakening, and from a state of remembrance accompanied by awakening to a state of remembrance accompanied by presence, hudur, and from a state of remembrance accompanied by presence to a state of remembrance accompanied by absence of all but the one being remembered. كل ما سوى المذكور وما ذلك على الله بعزيز and this is not rare for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really in those, I don't know, paragraphs like three, four lines, he pretty much summarized uh, and epitomized the methodology of dhikr. If we didn't have anything else that would teach us about, about doing dhikr and how to do it, uh, this might suffice us in that sense uh, and, and you know this is to me this is one of the hikam that is a, 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 a clear sign or a delil or a proof of the the sidq the sincerity of Ibn Atta al-Sakandari I can't imagine someone just came up with that and um, you know like to be clever this is a meaning that was put in his heart so he says don't do not abandon remembrance for your lack of presence right in other words you don't feel the spiritual connection you know, in our parlance, our modern parlance today, uh, while you're doing it, don't abandon it because of that. Why? For your rem- remissness, right, your forgetfulness of that, or lack of spiritual connection, uh, of the remembrance of Allah is worse than your remissness in the remembrance of Allah. So if you were to abandon it altogether, then that's rem- remembrance, lack of remembrance of Allah altogether, rather than lack of uh, hudur or presence in the remembrance. So your, your tongue is still obeying God. Your tongue is still um, present, as it were. So you're saying, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, la hawla wa kuntu illa billah, alhamdulillah, 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 subhanallah, 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 hasbi Allah wa na'amul wakil, hasbi Allah wa na'amul wakil. So even if your heart is not in that, but your tongue is, so that's a part of you, right? And uh, your tongue has your DNA in it, right? And, and, and the cells are there, and the DNA is, uh, uh, is kind of the blueprint for the rest of your body and the rest of the cells. So maybe the cells that are working with the tongue, right, they're going to, uh, you know, what do they, what do they say, the, the COVID vaccine, the messenger RNA, then comes and sends its messages out. So maybe the, the, the tongue will do that for you, and it will send the signals. And then maybe that signal will reach the heart, right? The real heart, the spiritual heart. And that's what Ibn Atta Iskandari is saying here. So it's much worse just not to do it at all. And that goes for all the, all the ibadat. Right? Yeah, I was praying the five times of prayer, but it's just not like, you know, it's not there for me. It's not happening. I must not be good at it. Or No, that's nothing. It doesn't mean that. It's, it's a gift in and of itself to be able to do it, even if uh, you're not feeling that connection. Because as we said, that part, that presence part, that connection part, that feeling like it's affecting you in a profound spiritual way, that's not really in your control. That's not your, you know, that's not your, your, the thing you should be thinking about or busy, busy with. We do these things, as our, ta- our teachers told us, امْتِثَالًا لِلْأَمْرِ وَمَحَبَّةً امْتِثَالَ الْأَمْرِ We are fulfilling the divine command. That in of itself is a type of dhikr. So you have at least that when you're doing it. When Allah says to you, اذكرني أذكركم Remember me, I remember you. Well, if you remember with the tongue, inshallah, Allah will remember you back. And Allah remembering you back can mean He gives you that remembrance in your heart. So don't give up uh, on anything because you're not feeling it or you're not feeling enthusiastic or um, it's become burdensome or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, it might become burdensome. It, you might not have the, the same appreciation or enthusiasm as maybe you had a while back. But Perhaps that is a test. It doesn't necessarily mean you did something wrong. You might have. It could be a type of uh, kind of a warning or signal from Allah. And, you know, Allah doesn't give warnings and signals except to those that He loves and He wants the good for them. Otherwise, He could leave you in a state called istidraj. Istidraj means seemingly everything is fine, even though you're not putting the effort in and engaging with God. But, like, your life otherwise seems fine. This is called istidraj. You know, we'll leave them for a while, but eventually the comeuppance will come. So it's better to get the, uh, you know, the red blinking warning lights in this life than the next life. Um, so perhaps he will raise you from a state of remembrance accompanied by remissness, like you're not 
there's no connection to a state of remembrance accompanied by awakening, right? And that's, awakening is what we call the initial spiritual connection, right? Awakening. Because before, what was it before that? Ghafla. Ghafla means you're, you're in a state of forgetfulness and you're not really aware of it. You don't know, in other words, you don't know what you're missing. So when you, when you awaken, you're like, oh, wait a minute. What was that? What was I doing? Now, now I see something different, completely different. You know? And that's kind of the initial uh, spark, as it were. So then you have the awakening. And then from a state of remembrance accompanied by awakening to one accompanied by presence, hudur. Right? And that's the real spiritual connection people are looking for. And then from hudur and presence uh, to one accompanied by absence of all but the one being remembered. Right? That's the real presence. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa aghna shuraka, la yuhibb shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you associating any with Him. So, in your heart, if you're remembering Him and you're kind of thinking about other stuff at the same time, there's still presence. Allah is present in your heart, but so are a million other things. But when you get to a state of only Allah, right? And, and this is the state where you're not even aware of yourself. So your own self-awareness kind of takes uh, a back seat because the awareness of God is so powerful and so profound and so strong, then this is what the Sheikh is describing here. Uh, a state of remembrance are coming by absence of all but the one being remembered. And that's the real object of the dhikr. That's the real purpose behind it, to get to that state. And, and that takes work. You know, that takes, you know, you may have to say something Many times, you may have to say La ilaha illallah a hundred times or two hundred times in a row. Try it, right, with, uh, w- with presence, or maybe eyes closed and, and try to zone out everything else and see where it takes you, you know, and this is what the, the Mashaykh would say, that you keep saying until you're in a state where it's kind of like you're witnessing as if you're not doing it, right, as if it's just, you know, happening and, and you're a witness to it, but you're not the fa'il, right, you're, you're maf'ul. You see that you're a mafool. You're not the doer, but you see you are the recipient of, of the dhikr, right? And this is when that part, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ Right? أَذْكُرْكُمْ That's the part we want to get to, that Allah remembers us. This is the deep spiritual uh, connection. And then after you've done that with your tongue, and then you leave that particular sitting, the, the anwar and the thamarat and the fruits of all of that stay with you. They remain with you, and they have a powerful effect. And some of them even tied it in with, with, with physicalities. They say, you know, try to avoid drinking something very cold for half an hour after that. Because dhikr is heat, right? And it's, and it's light, and, and, and it, will, it will permeate the body and permeate the soul. So if you introduce something cold, it's kind of like extinguishing that and putting it on and shutting it down. So um, uh, the remembrance of Allah is very, very, very powerful um, if we do it in a very dedicated and, and committed way. So... Um, Another hikmah, now these are kind of doing more with uh, the adab of supplication, right? the adab of dua. And dua is a type of dhikr. That's probably the most important lesson we should remember, that dua is not just about asking for something that you need, but it's a, ty- it's a way of remembering Allah, and that's why we included it in this general category of dhikr. Right? We said there's praise, we mentioned the praise aspect, and we said there is... Um, uh, supplication, dua, and then there is ri'ayah, right? Mentioning Allah, having this engagement and relationship and khitab and, and way of speaking to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, on a basic level, and this is the first hikmah that Ibn uh, al Sikandi mentions in the hikmah, regard, in the hikam, regarding dua, he said, do not allow the perceived delay in the answer of providence, yani Allah, accompanied by fervent supplication to lead you to fall into despair. He has assured you of the answer in the manner he chooses for you rather than in the manner you choose for yourself and in the time he desires rather than the time you desire. This is like, let's call it Dua 101. This is essential and critical. If we were just to imbibe that aspect and that understanding of Dua, we would have so much ease and facilitation after that. Uh, so, you know, don't think, perce- and, you know, and we translate here as perceived delay. Uh, you know, that might not have been Arabic, but that's, I think, the meaning, the perceived delay. It's not really a delay. 
it's your expectation or it's your wish that it give it to me right now I want this thing right now or I want this mushkila I want this problem to go away immediately and that's normal uh, human sentiment if you're sick if you're you know something is troubling you we don't want trouble and, and we want it to go away and that's normal and perhaps Allah gives you trouble so that you may call upon him but when you call upon him call upon him in the manner that is commensurate with the majesty of God not someone who is not aware of that so first step don't allow the perceived delay even if you keep asking right fervent supplication to lead you to fall into despair right don't let it lead you to yes to despair and you feel like why is Allah not answering me? Why is He not hearing me? Does He not hear me? All those, all those statements are completely untrue statements. right? And, and your spiritual eye should say, wait a minute, you can't say that, you can't think that. Because we know Allah sees everything, and He hears everything, and He's completely aware of everything. So that's not a possibility. So I shouldn't go into a state of despair because I think He doesn't hear me, or He doesn't see me, or He's not paying attention. A'udhu Billah. So, uh, then he says, for he has assured you of the answer. How has he assured me of the answer? Ud'uni astajib lakum. That's Quran. Ud'uni astajib lakum. Ud'uni astajib lakum. Right? This is what's called talab wa jawab al-talab. And then it's majzum in Arabic. So it means it's a, it's a, it's a, a you know, ud'uni, it's a command. And then the conditional uh, phrase that comes after the command means if, if you call upon me, I will answer you. Ud'uni astajib lakum. So, call upon Allah, He will answer you. But, how will He answer you? He said, He has assured you of the answer in the manner He chooses for you, rather than in the manner you choose for yourself, and in the time He desires, rather than the time that you desire. And if you think about it, and really you don't have to think that deeply about it, isn't that a much better deal for us than for us to say, oh, I want it in this way and in this time? من الحكيم من العليم من القهار من القدير uh, من العزيز isn't Allah all those things so shouldn't he be the one who kind of knows what's better for us than ourselves so they say the key to having your dua answered right uh, one of the keys anyway it's not the only key but one of the keys is that you have تفويد الإجابة لله سبحانه وتعالى إلى الله سبحانه وتعالى so put complete agency in the manner that it's going to be answered with Allah. So when you ask, Ya Allah, hidini, Ya Allah, shfini, Ya Allah, rizukni, Ya Allah, kada. Put tafweed, put complete agency in the answer. And Allah, you're going to answer the way that you're going to answer it. You know, it's not for me to, to say, answer it this way or that way. I've made a request and I am beseeching you and I'm imploring you. And uh, Allah will answer in the manner that he's going to answer. In, and I'm fine with that. And then that's that's perfect, and that's the way it should be. Um, so that's kind of one aspect. Um, another hikmah that I wanted also to look at, where he says, closely related, do not request of him to release you from a situation so that you may be useful in another. For if he so desires, he can make you useful without releasing you from that situation. So this talab uh, could mean in the form of dua or could be in the form of a wish. Right? And it's even asking you, like, what are the things you should be asking for or how should you be asking them? So this also is a lot of the, the, the root cause of this particular, let's say, stance with God, engagement with Allah. Like, I think I'd do much better if Allah put me in that particular situation. You know, if only Allah SWT would relieve me of this job that I'm in and I can uh, go study in uh, the hills of uh, you know, some far off distant land where all of the people behave like the Sahaba and uh, we live you know, purely and we drink only organic raw milk and you know, then that life is going to be I really will be a great worshipper of Allah and I'll be a much better Muslim uh, than this situation I'm in right now. Yani, to put it yani, bluntly, هذا جهل بالله that's ignorance of God. Why? Who put you in the situation to begin with? Allah put you in the situation. He, where you are not, not right now is where, where Allah wants you to be. And if He wanted to 
make you useful or better somewhere else, then he would do that without you asking him. So, you know, even the manner that we should ask those things, it should be, and that's why, you know, the adab, for example, with uh, istikhara, right? We talk about istikhara, dua, istikhara. It's a particular type of dua. And istikhara means seeking the good of something, requesting the good. So in those things that are equally halal, let's say, option A or option B, or maybe there's an option C, it could be multiple things, and you want to make the right decision and you're not sure which one to do, so you do dua istikhara. But what is the sigha? What is the formula of du'a istikhara? In alimt, ya Allah, in hadha al-amr khayran li wa li ahbabi wa muslimin fi dini wa dunyaya wa ma'ashi wa aqibata amri fa yasirhu li. Right? When kunta ta'alam in hadha al-amr sharran li wa li ahbabi wa muslimin fi dini wa ma'ashi wa akhirati ila akhirihi fa srifni anhu wa srifna anhu. That's the sigha. Right? It's conditional. Oh Allah, you know everything. So if you know that this matter, this choice that I might embark upon is going to be good for me and my family and the Muslims and it's going to be better for my dunya and better for my deen and better for my akhirah and better for my aqabit al-amr, yani in the end of the day, when everything is finished, if it's going to be better for all of those things, make it, facilitate it for me. وَإِن كُنْتَ تَعْلَمْ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ أَوْ إِنْ عَلِمْتَ أَنْ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ شَرًّا لِي But if you know that this matter, which Allah knows, obviously, it's worse for me, and it's going to be worse for my akhirah, and it's going to be worse for everything about me. فَصْرِفْنِ anhu. Then take it away from me. I don't have anything to do with it. This is man of tafweed. This is putting complete agency with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's in those things that are, um, you know, permissible, but, you know, not in things that are considered to be like qurab and acts of worship. You know, oh Allah, um, uh, you know, uh, do I do istikhar about praying the five prayers? or going to Hajj, or... No, not about those things. These are things Allah has asked of you. You ask Allah to help you in fulfilling them, right? And one of the best things to ask is to ask Allah's aid and guidance in fulfilling those things He's asked of you. They said this is one of the best type of du'a to make. So our, 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 our type of supplication should be general. It should be, uh, you know, uh, accentuated by tafweed, by putting agency in Allah. That's why the general du'a you look at the Prophet said, and most of his dua was very general. Give us the good of this life and the good of the next life and keep us away from the punishment of, of the hellfire. Um, one of the dua you can ask, that's shamil also. Uh, I ask you of all the good things that the Prophet asked you. And I seek refuge from all the all the things that he sought refuge from. Ah, the du'a It's comprehensive, right? It covers everything. And so, in general, that should be the types of du'a. And then when we're asking for things that are specific, that are halal, but we don't know the outcome of which is going to be good for us or, or, or not, then it should be in this formula of istikhara, those things. So if you say, "Oh Allah, uh, you know, give me this person to marry this specific person." You don't know if there's going to be good in that. That needs istikhara. And, and, and also istishara. Istishara is to seek wise people and good people uh, and seek good counsel on those things. But you also you want the blessing <coughs> and the idhin of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think we've uh, come upon the hour. We've finished it. So uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, Insha'Allah. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah fikum. As'adakumullah fi dunya wal akhirah.